Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now in this video, I want to explore the idea of power usage versus performance. In other words, as the performance increases in a CPU, then there is more power use. Now specifically, I'm be looking at mobile CPUs, but of course this actually applies to desktop CPUs, laptop CPUs, server CPUs. So general rule, the more performance you want, the more power you're going to have to uh, use. Now, of course, in a uh, smartphone, that's really, really important because of course you've got a battery and you're trying to run the uh, device from a battery, not plugged into the mains, not with big fans in your hand. You've got limited amount of thermal budget, limited amount of power budget. So how much you use to produce a performance becomes really important. Now, this is really the introduction to a whole series of videos I want to do about this. And I'll talk more about what I have planned towards the end. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to be concentrating on uh, smartphones. So basically, to do this testing, what I need to do is take a smartphone. First of all, we need to root it. So it's an Android smartphone, and I root it so that I get control over certain parameters to do with the CPU, namely the governor that's used, and we'll talk more about that in a second, and the clock speed. Now, the governor, it determines how the CPU is used. For example, there is an energy-aware scheduler that actually decides which CPU a particular task should run on depending on how much heat is already being produced, depending on which cores are already fired up and active, and it swaps them around to give you the most energy efficient use, but not necessarily the greatest performance. Now, on an Android smartphone, the scheduler for that, the SCED util, is actually the default one in many cases. So I've used the performance governor, which fixed the CPU at a certain clock speed and doesn't swap it around to other things uh, depending on the energy. It just says, give me that performance. And that allows us to measure the performance of a particular CPU core. Secondly, it also allows me to fix the clock rate. So I can say this is the maximum clock rate of that CPU, which means we can see the performance and the energy usage at a certain clock speed. And the other thing is we tie a certain task to a certain CPU cores. So obviously, we've got, let's say, in a Snapdragon, you may have three different types of processors, the energy efficiency processors, the kind of the uh, performance ones and the high performance ones. And obviously, we want to measure the performance characteristics of each one of those. So you can say, run this only on this CPU core. Now, once you've done root, you can do all of those things. And then, of course, we need to measure the power. Now, there are different ways to do that. The easiest way, it's really, really handy. And I looked into this years ago. In fact, when I did a review for Android Authority of a device uh, which was designed specifically for doing this kind of testing. Uh, basically, if you charge up the battery to full and not just to 100 percent, but like to absolute full, then when you start running the smartphone, the power that's drawn via the USB port is actually how much power is being used by the CPU. None of it is being dedicated to charging. And you can see that quite easily when you're actually monitoring the power usage and the battery level. And then, of course, we need to know what the background uh, power use is. So, for example, how much is the screen taking? We put the device into flight mode so the radios aren't being used. How much power does the CPU use when it's just ticking over, not doing anything? Once you have that baseline amount, then when you start running a task, it will go up and we can see the difference. And then to measure that difference, actually, we're going to run some benchmarks. Now, at the moment, I'm running my own benchmark. This is available on my GitHub repository. So it basically works out how many uh, SHA-256 uh, hashes can be calculated in a fixed time period, in this case, 20 seconds. And this is without CPU acceleration. So it's just doing the actual work that needs to be done in the CPU. And that's OK. That's what we want. We don't want hardware acceleration because we want to exercise the CPU and working out a secure uh, hash 256 is just as good as any task in any other. There are, of course, other tasks that we could load it with. And as with all benchmarking, different tasks do have the potential to show out different types of characteristics. But this testing has given actually quite a good set of results. And I want to introduce more benchmarking features in the future. And again, I'll talk about that at the end of the video. So for this test, I'm using a Snapdragon 888 CPU inside of a OnePlus device. Now that's got three different types of CPU cores. It's got a Cortex-A55, it's got four of those. It's got Cortex-A78, it's got three of those. And it's got Cortex-X1, and it's got one of those. Now these all have different properties in terms of clock speed, in terms of power efficiency, and in terms of performance. 
Now, why am I using the Snapdragon 888, you might ask? Well, reasons are the following. First of all, this is an introduction video, and I wanted to do this on a device that I was very familiar with, wasn't going to be something bleeding edge, you know, trouble trying to root a brand new phone that's got a brand new process that just come out. So I'm going back to something that I know I could root okay and I could run okay. Secondly, I do want to build up some historical data. So this will be the first CPU. And then obviously I want to move on to other CPUs in time so that I can build up an actual database and some graphs that show the differences between these CPUs. And you have to start somewhere. So I'm starting with the Snapdragon 888. And thirdly, and this is a very practical thing, it is actually a device I actually had here without having to try to to borrow or acquire a different device. I actually had a Snapdragon 888 device here and I thought that would be a good place to start. So I've got some graphs that I've done using all this testing. And so let's look at the graphs and see what information we can uh, glean. Okay, so this first graph, the frequency is along the bottom. You can see three lines for the three different cores, Cortex-A55, Cortex-A78, Cortex-X1, and then the performance number coming out of my uh, SHA256 benchmark is on the other axis. And so what we can see is as you increase the clock speed, you increase the performance. That's exactly what we would expect. However, the line of that is not necessarily, you know, 45 degrees or, you know, 80 degrees. We can see that there is a co direct linear correlation between them, but it's not particularly uh, steep. So what are we seeing here? We can see the Cortex A55 at the bottom here, if you start at around you know 600 uh, megahertz, then you can see as you go up, right up higher until just under 1.8 uh, gigahertz, you can see the performance go up uh, in a straight line there. Now that's relative, of course, to the Cortex A78. That's the red line on here. So when you start that at a lower frequency, you know, uh, 700, 800 megahertz, you can see that already it gives you a greater performance. So that shows the difference between a Cortex A55 and a Cortex A78. The Cortex A55 is an inline uh, processor, doesn't do out of order execution. The A78 does do out of order. So there are differences in their performance by their very design but there are also power differences, which we'll look at uh, in another graph. But you can see the Cortex A78 is faster than the Cortex A55 at the same clock speed, which is exactly what we would expect. And with the A78, as you increase the clock speed, you can you see that we increase the performance. And notice that it actually goes, uh, it actually diverges away from the Cortex A55. So you can see the performance act line is actually slightly steeper, which is better. So that actually gives us a greater performance. So at 1.8 gigahertz, you can see that the difference between the Cortex A55 and the A6 is actually wider, it's more significant than when you're down at a lower clock speed of 700 or 800 uh, megahertz. And now the yellow line is the Cortex X1. So this uh, we can see again has in general a uh, greater performance than the Cortex A78, particularly again in higher clock frequencies, we can see the two start to diverge. But of course, the key thing here is that the Cortex A1 goes up to even higher clock speeds, greater than the Cortex A78, and gives you even uh, greater that peak performance. So there's an interesting relationship between the performance and the frequency. And we can see, of course, the X1 gives you the best performance for any particular clock speed. Now this second graph shows us uh, the frequency on the y-axis and the amount of power being used on the x-axis. So this demonstrates that the uh, bigger CPUs need more power. So again, starting with the blue line here, we can see that the power usage of the Cortex A55 is pretty good. It's the lowest of all of them. And actually that first part, that steep line there, we can see that the uh, as the clock frequency goes up, the power does not increase uh, too much. Now there's obviously a, a curve here, a peak. And then we can see that as you go up even higher clock speeds and you get more and more power being used. So obviously that's not a very efficient part of the Cortex A55. The other part before that corner, before that peak, you can see that great, very almost up, straight upward line. So that really does give us a, just a feel for the fact that the not much more power is being used as you increase the frequency. Now the Cortex A78, as we'd expect, gives us again, uh, greater performance. And you can see here that more power is being used 
from the start. So you've got more power being used at the same clock speed. So earlier on I showed you get more performance for that clock speed, but you're using more power. And this curve is much, much nicer, much more uh, kind of like a rounded curve, not with a, 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 a pronounced kind of peak to it. So it just follows that nice curve that as we go up with clock frequency, we increase the power and we know that also then increases the performance. And the same can be said for the X1. Again, uh, using more power to start with. And as you go up the curve, it's, uh, you know, using more power than the Cortex A78, but we're also getting greater performance. So for the most power efficient, we've got the Cortex A55, which you would expect. The Cortex A78 is the middle cause. And then the Cortex X1 uh, has that ultimate performance, but comes at a cost of the power. And then this final graph shows us the performance against the power. It's not just the clock frequency, but the performance that's coming out from that benchmark of mine. So again, we see the Cortex A55. We can see that it's not using much power. And then as the performance goes up, we can see that there's more and more power being used. And again, we have that plateau that shows us that in the last little bit, that you're not getting much performance for quite a big increase in power. So at the top end, it's not really giving uh, that kind of greater performance, but it is consuming more power. But that's okay because these are used in this heterogeneous setup. So all three different core types are used in one processor. And the idea is you can switch to a different core. And that's exactly what we want to do. There's a point here where the Cortex A78 crosses the line of the uh, Cortex X55. And at that point, you would want to switch over to the Cortex A78 because it's providing greater performance for uh, less power. So that power curve then goes up here and you can see there's a point where it crosses over the Cortex X1, which we'll talk about uh, in a minute. But again, you can see at the low end, you want to switch to the A78 quite early. That's what the schedule would want to do and then stick with it right up until we get into the region of the Cortex X1. Now the Cortex X1 is the yellow line here again you can see that it's offering uh, more power usage of course because it is the more powerful cpu but there it very quickly goes up and start taking over the performance but you would want to stay on the cortex a78 until this point where they cross over there's a parallel bit here where you're kind of getting the same performance for the same amount of power and then ultimately the cortex x1 goes away on its own, leaves the Cortex A78 behind, and that's where you're getting the maximum performance, but of course you still are using more power. Now it's also worth giving these numbers some context. We're seeing how much the CPU is using at its different uh, kind of you know performance levels, and sometimes at the highest peak it can go up over two watts. Now it's also worth remembering that when you're playing 3D games, the GPU is gonna be used, and that's also gonna produce its own uh, heat and draw its own amount of power. And also just using the phone without really doing anything. As I said, there's an idle kind of background uh, power. So the screen takes, for example, some power, the Wi-Fi, your 4G, 5G, they all take power. So for example, the screen on the lowest brightness setting on this particular one uh, plus device I was using uses 0.8 watts. Uh, so literally, if you're just staring at your phone, reading something, you're using 0.8 watts just for the power of the screen. And if you up the uh, the brightness, then that can go up to over one watt. If you then add in Wi-Fi, so for example, I started pinging something using Wi-Fi, that can go up to 1.1 watts, 1.2 watts. So while these CPU numbers are important and why they are interesting, it isn't also the complete story. The battery is drained on your phone from several other sources, not only the CPU, the screen, the radios, the GPU, writing to the storage, and so on. They all use up power. Okay, so there you have it. So you see how the different CPU designs, difference between, for example, in order, without out of order execution, without so much sophisticated stuff for branch prediction and all this kind of stuff, instruction level parallelism, you can see the power efficiency versus the uh, performance. And you can see that the X1 core is designed for that maximum peak performance. That's why you find it in this four plus three plus one setup. So there is an X1, so you get that peak performance when you need it. It will use a bit more battery to do that. But when you've got other tasks going on, then you want to run them on the Cortex A55 or on the Cortex A78, depending on the exact nature of the workload. 
and then together they work as a kind of a one unit to give you that best performance and power efficiency. Okay, so there you can see how all three CPU cores offer different features, different characteristics, depending on performance and depending on power efficiency. And that's why they work together. Uh, there's not just one of these cores, there's eight of them, and they can be picked different cores depending on whether you want peak performance or whether you need a background task that runs at the most uh, efficient way. Now, as I said, this is the first in a series of videos I will be looking at other mobile processors, other ones from Qualcomm, other ones from uh, MediaTek. It does partly depend on how uh, well received this video is. That's just a fact of life. But my hope is to be able to make more videos doing the same kind of analysis. Now, getting out all those numbers, they look easy when they're on a graph, but there's a lot of work involved in running all of those tests, all the different clock speeds on all the different types of core design, getting it all noted down, plotting it all, uh, and so on. Now, also, I would like to expand the types of benchmark I'm running. This, as I said, is my own code that's available in my GitHub repository. However, it would be good to maybe move to some of the more industry standard ones, like, for example, the Specint or a Spec CPU 2017. The downside of that is it costs money to buy, about $1,000, I think, the last time I checked. And so that depends on partly on whether you find the viewers find this video interesting and whether the information is uh, useful. Okay, that's it. My name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. If you like these kind of videos, then I really do ask you to stick around by subscribing to the channel. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.